The Bible says that Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, Truly, in the times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this by rising him from the dead. Raising him from the dead. He has appointed a day and called men everywhere to repent. Now, it's taught today in the churches, in the Sunday school classes, by the evangelists, by everybody that goes out there and witnesses to the, to the people in, in the world, the world at large, that man's incapable of repenting, that God has to believe for him, that faith is some kind of a gift. He has to be bestowed upon him. He can do everything else in his life. He can stop cheating on his wife, he can stop drinking, he can stop taking drugs, but he can't turn to God unless God does it for him in some manner. Now all the preachers will vary, many of the preachers will vary between what they'll say, how that works. But they all agree that man's born depraved in some state of depravity with this nature of sin inherited from Adam that he's unable to turn to God of his own accord. It has to be coerced or compelled in some manner by the grace of God so that he can believe in God and turn from his sin. And turning from his sin, of course, is receiving Jesus. Receiving Jesus. That's basically the gospel today. You admit you're a sinner and you receive Jesus. Some people have you repeat words. Some people get you down on your knees and ask you if you're sincere and make sure there's a couple of tears in your eye and, and uh, did you really forsake everything and, and lay it all on the altar. Some of them, you know, get, get down to the nitty gritty there. But it all has to do with forsake, receiving Jesus and admitting you're a sinner. That's the gospel that's being presented. But that's not the gospel in the book of Acts. That's not how man was to be reconciled to God. Through the, through the sin offering of Christ. Repentance was supposed to be an act that was proven by deeds. Repentance, repentance, proven by deeds. In Acts 26, verses 18 through 20, we see in that chapter... Now let your, let your repentance, in, in, verse, in verse 20, he says, He declared to all those in Damascus and in Jerusalem that throughout all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works befitting repentance. In other words, their deeds must prove their repentance. Just like your faith. Your faith fits right into this underneath. Your faith works by love. So faith of itself is a work. They tell you today you're not saved of work by works. At least anyone should boast. And if you attribute any anything to man, even the faith or the working faith, then you're attributing uh, salvation to man and not to God. That's how they look at it. They automatically see it that way. They don't see any of this workers together with God like Paul talked about in the New Testament. Well, they'll admit faith without works is dead, but they won't show that faith in works, faith equals a work. There's a law of faith. Law of faith. It talks about in Romans chapter 3. And that law of faith establishes, establishes the law. Upholds the commandments. Upholds. Holds fast to the teachings of Christ. That's faith. Otherwise, it's the faith of devils. It's the faith that James talked about in James 2.19. If you go to James chapter 2 and you read from verse 19 to 24, you see it talks about Abraham there and Abraham's faith. His faith was proven by his deeds. So man's not saved by faith alone, James says. See, that's the reason Luther, that all your, your preachers and your Sunday school teachers love to quote Martin Luther, they love to quote, and Luther taught faith alone. He thought the epistle of James was the epistle of straw, to be burned, in other words, thrown out of the Bible, because he said faith alone is not saved. 
Why? Because faith alone is the faith of the devils. Like he said in verse 19, the devils believe, just like you believe. You believe in God and they tremble in fear of God. But faith is a faith that upholds, establishes, holds fast, keeps the commandments. That's how it's tied into repentance. And that's how it's tied into the reconciliation. Now, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we see verses 10 and 11. We see, For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, and what vindication. It's like justification. In all these things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. So what's this say? See, no pastor is going to tell you this. No Sunday school teacher is going to tell you that this is necessary for salvation. But here it is. Just like Titus 2.11 is the definition of grace. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live sober, righteously, self-controlled lives in this present age. No, they're never, they won't tell you that, and they don't tell you this. That repentance starts with godly sorrow. Godly sorrow for sin. And a conviction. A conviction of that wrongdoing. I call it a crisis of conviction. Because that's what I see people going through that have real repentance and a real experience with God. What's that lead to then in verse 11? He says, For observe this very thing. You sorrowed in a godly manner under this conviction. Not a worldly manner. Not sorry, you know, you go and you, you confess your sins, that you're a sinner and you receive Jesus. That's the word, sorrow of the world. That doesn't save anyone. You don't touch the blood here at all. Here he's talking about in a godly manner, it produced diligence. First thing, diligence. Diligence to do what is right. What is right. See, you can't do what's right unless, after you get saved. That's what they're telling you. See, you come in, you receive Jesus, you're saved in your sins, and then later on God cleans you up, and eventually you might do what's right. You might give up your pornography, Pornography, you're drinking, you're, you're, you're uh, messing around and running around with uh, women and, and all. You might forgive those things up. But see, if you never do what's right to begin with, you'll never do what's right. And that's what happens. That's exactly what happens. They give all these illustrations about how it's all paid for in advance. But there's nothing in the scriptures that teach anything like that. It produces a diligence to do what's right. That leads to the clearing, the clearing of the wrongdoing. Clearing of wrongdoing. This is the most important part that most people, it goes right over their head. Most people, if you go into a church and you tell them, or a Sunday school class or a Bible study today, that's under this lie that's being taught everywhere, and you talk about a clearing of wrongdoing, making restitution, they'll either think you're Catholic or they'll think you're nuts. I guarantee it. They won't know, have an idea what you're talking about. Not the slightest clue what you mean by a clearing of wrongdoing. Because they've never heard this before. They've never seen that verse. A lot of people read verse 10, godly sorrow and repentance. They still, some part of the church still uses the word repentance. Some of them don't even use the word repentance anymore, but some of them still do. But nevertheless, they never go down and tell you what is repentance. They say, oh, it's a change of mind about sin. Oh, it's a willingness to stop sinning. Oh, it's uh, you, you'll hate your sin. They might say those kind of things. But it's never stopping of sin. The clearing is a stopping. Look it up. Look up what that word means. You're laying it all out, man. You did wrong. You did wrong. You stole. You cheated. You lied. You're going to make it right. You're going to do everything like Zacchaeus in Luke's gospel, the, the story of Zacchaeus. See, in, in today's salvation, Zacchaeus would have been told, well, Jesus did it all for you. That's what Ray Comfort would tell the guy. Well, Jesus provided already, Zacchaeus. You don't have to sell your goods and restore what you stole and all that other things you said. So you don't have to do that because it's already been done. It's been provided already. 
There's been a provision made. That's their gospel. So therefore, you can come down from that tree and you can forget about it. But is that what Jesus said? No, when he told Jesus what he had done, this clearing and stopping, he stopped being a tax collector. He restored what he stole. He gave back more than he stole. Jesus said, today's salvation has come to your house. See, this is the picture of repentance in the Bible, all the way, like in Nineveh, in Jonah chapter 3, in verses 5 through 10. The people stopped their evil doing. They amended their ways. They stopped everything that they were doing in the city. The king shut down the entire city and cried out to God for mercy. Not thinking that they could save themselves. Not thinking that that act was something that was of, of virtue or merit. It had nothing to do with any of that. It was that that was the requirement that they knew from the preaching of the prophets in the land that God may, he said, perhaps God will relent from his disaster he's going to bring on us. Perhaps if we cry out, if we show him that we're sincere, if we show sincerity and purity and love to his truth, perhaps he will relent because he's a merciful God. He's willing. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. He's long-suffering and patient and kind. He's even kind to the wicked, the Bible says, as he gives them space to repent. So that's what they were banking on, not any of their own goodness, not their acts or their deeds. See, it's ridiculous, but right away, these, these people that preach this lie will tell you, well, if you can do that, if you can believe, then you're, you know, you're going to be arrogant. And you're gonna... I don't see anybody that ever came through repentance that had any arrogance or pride in them. I don't see anyone. I see the very opposite. I see the people inside the system that came under the lie, received Jesus nonsense. They're the ones full of arrogance and pride and strife and bitterness and wrath and everything else. It's the people just like it, the, the sheep and the goats. Who was it? It was it was it was it the goats that, that well Lord, we did this and we did that for you and, and we did it all. It was the sheep that said, Well, when, Lord? When did we do those things? Why? Well, because it was your duty to do. It's nothing to boast about. And no one that comes through repentance is going to boast because they see the mercy of God. But the clearing of the wrongdoing, the clearing and indignation and the fear, the godly fear and that goes along with the sorrow for sin and a desire and a zeal to do what's right, to be clear of these things, to have your conscience purged of dead works, like Hebrews 9.14 says. That's how you touch the blood. See, the blood, when you come to the reconciliation, you come to Christ, the mercy seat, the propitiation. That's the mercy seat. It's the propitiation. Read Hebrews. It's translated mercy seat there. You know, it's translated propitiation in Romans. That's where you go to plead for mercy. The blood of, the blood of a sinless victim, Christ, is sprinkled upon the living sacrifice. See, it was not a dead sacrifice anymore. We're not talking about the blood of animals here sprinkled on the altar. We're talking about the blood of Christ, a new and living way, as Hebrews talks about. That's sprinkled upon the living sacrifice to purge and to cleanse the heart of sin. That's when you know that you've been forgiven. Here, like I say, these people come in, they admit they're a sinner, they receive Jesus. There's no change. There's absolutely no change in their behavior. They're still vile. They're still full of strife. I mean, I know professed Christians that think that they're, they're supreme Christians that they, they cuss horribly. Their mouth cannot be stopped from the horrible things that they say. And their lives reflect that they still have bitterness and hate. Why? Because, well, they come in, they're told they're saved in their sins, and they're sinners. They can't help what they are because they were born that way. See, they're told that. And it's constantly weaved in and blended into every sermon they hear. And pretty soon it's just kind of taken right in. You don't even realize what's being said. Well, he said you got to obey God. He said that you got to bear fruit. Well, but is bearing fruit conditional? Is serving God conditional? Is clearing yourself of wrongdoing conditional? See, no, it's not. Only believing in Jesus. That's all that matters. But see this, this zeal, this desire, this vehement desire leads to a justification. 
And then it leads to, as he said, the last thing he says, in all these things you proved yourself to be clear. Clear. In this matter. Clear. That word is pure. That's the only place in the New Testament that that word's not translated pure or purity. Pure. Without defilement. So this repentance leads to a pure purity. What's the purpose of the commandment? Sincerity, purity, and love. What's faith do? What's faith do? Faith purifies the heart. Acts 15.9 When Peter was testifying to the Jerusalem council, he said that the Gentiles received the salvation in the same way we did. They were purified by faith. Their hearts were purified by faith. How? Through this. Through the repentance. Through the repentance. Because it's faith towards God, repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. All the way through the book of Acts. Preach repentance. He tells them in Luke 24, preach repentance for the remission of sins. There's no remission of sins in receiving Jesus and remitting you're a sinner. There's no way your sins can be remitted. You might as well be a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or some other cult. It's, it's not happening. I don't care. They, they think they're Christians. You think these men in these churches are Christians. They're not. They're not preaching the gospel of the Bible. The gospel of the Bible has to do with the repentance proven by deeds and a faith working by love. It has to do with a means that brings you into a right standing with God. That's all. That's what grace is not a covering. The propitiation is the covering. It's where the mercy seat where you go to plead for mercy. Grace brings you into an acceptable state. Acceptable state with God. You don't believe me? Look, look in the Scriptures. Look in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, he says, Let us have grace. That we may serve Him acceptably with reverence in godly fear. Let us have grace. That we may serve Him acceptably with godly fear. He says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken... Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. See, that's how grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live sober, righteous, self-controlled lives in this present age. The grace of God that brings salvation to be acceptable unto God in a savable state. He's got to bring you back to obedience to the law. That's why faith upholds the law. Being dead to the law doesn't mean that the law has been chucked out the window like these guys are here telling you. That the curse of the law has been removed, meaning the curse was death. The curse was, you broke the law, you die. Just by returning to obedience to the law, no, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. It would be nice if you lived in obedience to the law. Surely, it would be a lot better for you in your life. Even in, even in a worldly sense. But it won't remit your sins. You understand? It won't, re, it won't remit. Your sins will not be, there won't be a sin offering for your sins. Or a, we use the word atonement a lot, but that word was invented. Your sins have to be remitted first. And that only happens by blood. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission there is no remission. That's the law says. The law says. So if the law says without the shedding of blood there's no remission, how's the law chucked out the window by they go to Romans 7, 4 and say, well, the Christian's dead to the law. It has no demands, no condemnation. No, no, they're taking it to a stretch. Just like they're taking the other verses like in Romans where while we were yet sinners, Christ died, you know, to show that, well, our future sins were already forgiven. All we got to do is accept the fact that they are. And then he exchanges places with us, and he was our substitute. He took our penalty. He went, even went to hell for us, and all that nonsense. See, that gospel is not the gospel of the Bible. It's not the gospel. I don't know how you could be persuaded to look into this, to research and find what the truth is when you've been under the lie for so long. I don't know. I don't know. It's beyond me to, to even know where to begin with many people that have been under the lie for a long, long time. Because their mind is numb to the truth. 
They don't see the dynamic of faith. They don't see the principle behind faith and the principle behind a working repentance proven by deeds. They think the deeds are works, and you can't have works, not saved by works, so therefore faith has to be some kind of gift that's bestowed upon man because he can't believe. Of course, that's the hardcore Calvinist belief, but many people still hold to that, even though they don't hold to all five points of that, that horrible teaching. They're still going to say, well, the faith. But why would Paul say, you believe from your heart? that form a doctrine to which you were delivering, have delivered, having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. How can he say that if faith has to be given to you as a gift? If there's, not, if there's not within you the ability to obey God, then why does the Bible say from cover to cover that you obey God? Just like it, it talked, when, when God talked to Cain, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. See, what's it say right before that? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do, do well. If you do well. See, that's what his brother did. You go to Hebrews chapter 11, that's what you see. His, what he did testified that he was righteous. See, he attained, he attained to that righteousness by, by the acts that he performed. In Hebrews 11, 4, by faith... Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying to his gifts, and though he's dead, yet he speaks in, in faith. In other, words, he, in other words, he accomplished a task, is what that means. I've looked that up. Obtained witness means, means he accomplished a task. And his brother didn't because he's, God said to him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. It's all through the scriptures that way. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18. I mean, it's, it's as plain as the nose on your face that sin is not inherited. It doesn't come from your parents. It doesn't hand it down to you. It's not in your genes. It's not in your flesh. It's in your desires and your choices. You're responsible. The soul that sins shall die. The righteous man, his righteousness will save him. The wicked man, his wickedness will destroy him. If the righteous man turns from his righteousness, what happens? He testifies in that chapter, then all his righteous deeds will not be remembered. And the wickedness for which he's done, he will die in his sin. But if he turns from his sin, he'll live. That's, that's God. That's the, the ultimate fairness of a God that's given you a free and moral choice. See, like I said, under the lie, they're telling you that you can't turn to God. You have to be given all this, coerced or compelled somehow. But yet, all the, everything else in your life, you can choose where you work, where you go to school, uh, where you go to college, who you marry, uh, how much money you're going to earn. You can choose all that other stuff in your life. Whether or not you're going to be good to your kids or bad to your kids or nice to your mom and dad, but you can't choose God. You see how foolish that is? Well, if you can't choose God, then you're a robot. God created you as a robot. Then Calvin was right that he's got puppet on a string. He chose this one and didn't choose that one. You can get those people by asking them one question. Ask them, well, what happens then to the babies if they die in infancy? What happens to them? You get a variety of answers from those guys, but a lot of them are going to assign children into hell. They won't say it outright a lot of time. Very few of them will. Some of them do, but not very many of them. But they're going to give you some answer. Well, it's decided by their parents. Oh, it's decided by uh, the uh, provenient grace or universal grace. Or, well, where does it say that in the Scriptures? Again, show me in the Scriptures. Just like trying to say a child's behavior proves that there's a sin nature proves nothing but he's a child you have to be able to go to the scriptures to prove that man is born with an inherited nature from Adam and you can't do that it's pure conjecture you understand what conjecture is they imply it just like they imply that your future sins are forgiven already just like they imply that just like they imply that Jesus switched places with you there's nothing in the scriptures that says Jesus was imputed to you 
It says your faith is imputed for righteousness. It never says anywhere that Jesus was imputed to you as righteousness. But that's what they'll say. Not only that, his, his righteousness and his obedience was imputed to you. He switched track records with you, they like to, like to say today. So they got all these people coming to church, going through this, mo this ritual, basically is all it is, told that they're saved now by faith alone. It's all been provided for them. Now they sat in the church waiting for God to take away their pornography and their drugs and their sex addiction and all the other stuff, their drunkenness and their molestation desires and all that. I'm waiting for God to take that away in my, in my overeating and all that other stuff. But I'm still saved in my sins. Again, where does it say that in the Bible? Where? Does it say that in that 2 Corinthians passage we just read? Does it say, the soul that sins shall die? He who sins is of the devil? That's what the scripture says. But no, you guys believe in that you can be in your sin, addicted to it, because you've been saved in it. He saved you in your sin, even though the judge won't forgive you while you're still committing the crime. Your wife or your spouse or your husband won't forgive you while you're still in the commission of adultery. You'd have to stop before you could even approach them and ask for mercy and forgiveness. You'd have to break off your relationship with that other person. But no, not with God. No, no, God's going to forgive you, not see you sin, and then replace uh, his, his Jesus glasses on so he doesn't see you committing your horrible, vile acts anymore. It's no wonder the people are so vile in the churches. Sometimes their behavior absolutely shocks me when I hear the things that they do. And they still consider them. They talk about people that are backslidden. They talk about, they talk about how they're, uh, they're teaching others and bringing them to salvation. And they're having these signs and wonders and manifestations of the Holy Spirit. It's all ridiculous. They're totally deceived under strong delusion because they've never come out of their sin to begin with. And plus they're being taught that lie. They're being taught basically every time they go to church, every time they open a book, every time they read something, every devotional, every study Bible and commentary teaches that lie. And it has for hundreds of years. No one's teaching a clearing of wrongdoing, a faith that works by love, a repentance proven by deeds. No one teaches those things. No one. Except the scriptures and the very, very early church disciples that followed the apostles. They taught it. And nobody wants to hear that. They don't want to hear that. This, you know, Paul taught this. He taught that we inherited sin from Adam. He taught our sins are forgiven in advance. He taught that we can never fall away no matter what we do. Yeah, well, where did he teach those things? Just like he told, just like Peter said, that people twist to their own destruction the words of Paul. Well, they were doing it then. They're still doing it. They twist it. Then he warns you in the very next verse, in Second Peter chapter three, about beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfast position, be led away in the error of the wicked. What's the error of the wicked? Do you mean? He means the strong delusion of twisting what this brother said, the apostle said. Yeah, you can take one verse out of Romans 5 or Romans chapter 3, and you can say, oh, there it is. See, you're forgiven. Just repeat after me. You confess with your mouth. You believe in your heart. Like they got the Romans road to salvation. It should be called the Romans road to perdition because that's where the people are going to end up. See, when Jesus said, few shall find it, and many wouldn't, he was talking about a narrow gate. He was talking about pressing your way through this narrow passage that was very difficult and hard to get through because of all the false teachers, the wolves in sheep's clothing. Remember, these guys don't look like wolves. They don't look like savage wolves. They look like sheep. Just like the guy in Revelation 13, the false prophet. We've got an army of false prophets out there that that represents in Revelation 13 that look like a lamb but speak the language of a dragon. They look like a lamb. They speak the language of a dragon. And you're sitting under them in your Sunday school classes and you're, pre you're preaching on Sunday morning. Some of you have been in there for all your life, and you think guys like me are nuts that preach this kind of a message. You won't listen to the truth if it hits you square in, square in the head. You know, I heard somebody today say that uh, you know, the, the, uh, some politician was more famous or more popular than Jesus. Well, certainly. Certainly he is. 
No one has ever preached the truth, has ever been famous or popular with the people. What did they do? They crucified Jesus. Why? To get him out of the way. They didn't know what they were doing to redeem mankind. You think that was their intention? Give me a break. They did that because he was threatening their position. Same with you do. If you went in there and told you're not born in sin and you got to stop sinning and you got to prove they're stop sinning by your deeds before you'll be forgiven. You'll be, you'll be crucified, so to speak. I mean, not nails driven through your hands like the dear Lord. But you'll be thrown out. You'll be ostracized. You'll be left by yourself. And people that preach the truth, that hold to this truth, many of them are alone. Many of them stand by themselves. And they have for a while. It's difficult. But Jesus said, count the cost. Put your hand to the plow and don't look back. Dig deep. That's what he told you. He didn't tell you to expect a rose garden here. Don't think I've th come to bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. The sword of truth that's going to cut people to the heart. That's what I come to bring. You're going to set a household against its own self. Because people are going to come to the truth, and most aren't going to come to the truth. Because man in his pride has exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature instead of the creator. The image, as they call it in Revelation, back to Revelation 13. They serve an image, an image that they created. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about that image that exalts itself above God. Everything that says is God. That's in their heart, see, the image. Christ is supposed to be in the heart of man, in the heart of his mind. The single eye unto God. That's why he tells you to pluck out your, your sinful eye of your flesh and cast it from you. Because that's where sin resides. That's where it resides. Cut it off. Cut off the hand. Pluck out the eye, metaphorically. But do it literally in your heart so that you can enter the kingdom. It's like you said, it's better to enter the kingdom maimed and crippled than to be cast into hell whole. Well, many will be cast in that day, just like they say in Matthew 7, 21, 21 to 23, where we did all these wonderful things. Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? We preached... We healed the sick. We, we did all these things in your name. And he's going to say, but you never knew you. I like to use that. But if you look that up, you find it means you were never approved. You were never approved. In other words, you, you, never, you came in in your sins. You came in under the lie. You came in believing that everything was provided for you, that there was nothing for you to do except know about Jesus. Well, the devils know. No, you have to have a faith, a faith that originates through godly sorrow and conviction and a clearing of wrongdoing, a stopping of the sin, a diligence, a fear. That's where the faith originates. That's where it originates. Not the, the rudiments of faith is like it says in Hebrews 11, that you believe God and that it rewards those that diligently seek Him. Like Hebrews 11:6. For without faith it's impossible to please God. Those who come to God must first believe that He is, and that he rewards those that diligently seek him. Isn't that what Jesus said? Ask, seek, knock. Push your way through that gate if you have to. Strive to enter. Fits right into what that says. See, everything's got to tie together in the scriptures. Otherwise, it casts the scriptures out. Ineffective. It render, renders repentance and faith null and void. Like what's been done by the lie. No, the rudiments of faith or believing that God is. But that's not saving faith. See, that's what they're telling you is saving faith. Oh, you believe God. You believe that He is. Oh, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, sure, sure. I believe I believe it. Well, then you're saved. No, you're not saved until you come through the means by which He has granted to mankind to come through. This is the reconciliation. See, repentance is faith is the reconciliation. I wish they'd throw that word atonement out that they created back in the 1600s. It's a reconciliation. Everywhere else, except in that one Romans passage, it's translated reconciliation. Meaning to set again with. Setting down. It's You come to that mercy seat. Begging for mercy. Like, just like the parable of the, the, unforgiving, the unforgiving servant. What did he do? He owed all that money. He owed 10,000 talents. And he couldn't, he couldn't pay. And he was going to lose his family and everything and be cast into prison to the torturers. But he begged for mercy. 
at the mercy seat. He reconciled with the Master, and the Master showed him mercy. Now, he said he would do anything if the Master showed him mercy. Well, the Master then showed him mercy. He was a merciful Master, as God is. But he didn't do anything, did he? What did he do in that parable? He went right out and turned against one of his fellow servants that owed him much less and demanded payment and cast that man into prison. When the master heard about this from other fellow servants, he said, you wicked servant, I forgave you a debt that you could have never repaid. And what did you do? You promised me, you promised me a diligence, a clearing, a stopping, a zeal to do what's right. You promised all that when you threw yourself at mercy and I forgave you of those horrible sins that you were guilty of death under that curse. But you wouldn't forgive your fellow man. You, to prison. You bind up to prison, to the tortures, until you pay back every last penny. Well, you can't pay back any, any penny. You go to eternity bound and gagged and cast into outer darkness. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the gospel. But is that the gospel that's being presented in your Sunday school class? No. No. Not even close. Not even close. But that's how you're reconciled to God. That's what the mercy seat's about. Many of the parables illustrate that. Many of them. The virgins, the talents, the workers in the vineyard, all of, illustrate the same thing I just went over. Like the sheep and the goats. The only difference between the sheep and the goats was what? What the sheep did and what the goats didn't do. That was the only difference. The only difference. And that's what's going to be the difference between faith that gets you into the kingdom and a faith that gets you into the church and into perdition eventually when you face judgment. And it's up to you to decide. I can't force you or hold a gun to your head or ram it down your throat. I can only persuade you with words. Faith comes by hearing the word. Many I know that have come to Christ have come reading the word. Others read the word and they get deceived. So just like Jesus said, there's one illustration of that in Matthew 6, that if, if the eye is bad, the whole body is full of darkness. The whole body is full of darkness. And how great is that darkness? See, if the eye is bad, if you never repented, you never stopped sinning, you never cleared yourself of that wrongdoing, but you came to Christ under the lie, the eye remained bad. So the whole body remains full of darkness. So everything you learn from that point on is it's twisted. It's dark. It's the spirit of error. The spirit of error and the spirit of truth cannot abide together. So therefore, the whole body is full of darkness. You can't discern spiritual things because the mind's still carnal. See, the old man's supposed to die with Christ, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Romans 6. See, that's a one-time deal. That happens in the past, not to be repeated. Now, see, I have people tell me in, in the, under the lie that that, is a life, lifelong uh, thing that you do all the time. But that's not the way Paul presented it in Romans 6. He presented it as not to be repeated, and that's why the Bible says, if you sin willfully against your knowledge of truth, no sacrifice remains. That's why it says that. Because it was a one time, you're supposed to crucify the old man. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. He said in Galatians 5.24. Have already, that's past tense. They have crucified. They did it in repentance. So you see, if you come in without the clearing, without the stopping, without the diligence, the fear, the, dil the zeal to do what's right, and then the purity that comes in the heart through the blood, then the eye's bad. It remains bad. And the whole body then is full of darkness. And you can't discern the truth. So you read the Bible all you want. You go to all the Bible studies and you remain in your sins. And pretty soon you're preaching the lie. And that's what happens to these people. And they have some kind of a euphoric uh, glow about them, many of them. They can fake it real good. But underneath, it's a little sinister. Because they're being led by the spirit of error. 
in leading others in the spirit of error. And that's a serious matter. That's borderline blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because you're trampling the blood and you're insulting the spirit of grace. So it's a serious matter not to go through real repentance and then to call yourself a Christian nonetheless because uh, Ray Comfort saved you or somebody else out there on the street. You need to wake up before it's too late.